structure. Okay, good morning. So, uh, so before I start, just a reminder: after the sermon, we will we will we will celebrate communion uh, this morning. For those on Zoom, y'all can keep uh, the bread and juice okay uh, ready. We continue our talk on the book of Colossians, right? A continue uh, 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 study on the book of Colossians. This is part two. Uh, Tarang started uh, part one yesterday. Uh, sorry. La last Sunday, it feels like yesterday. No, no, it doesn't. <laughs> and uh, I just wanted to share that most of what we are talking uh, from the book of Colossians is taken from this beautiful resource by published by the Good Book Company. Uh, the author is Mark Minnell. And uh, the central aim of his teaching through this resource is to see that uh, context is Bible-centered, Christ-glorifying, relevantly applied, but also easy to read and understand, okay? And my aim for today is similar. My aim for today is similar. So, a quick recap. Last week, Tarang taught us of how Paul wrote this letter to a people group that he has not met. But he is connected to them because of the mutuality of faith and an inner core belief of the gospel. Okay? And in some sense, last week, Tarang was actually showing us what we've also been studying about church life in the month of May. He was showing us that when we believe in the gospel, we are not only united to Christ, but in addition to being united to Christ, we are also deeply united to all those who are united to Christ. Okay? And so we're going to be seeing more truth from the same Bible passage we read last week. And I'm going to invite Adip, if he could come and just read this. So we're reading today. The Bible reading is Colossians 1, 1 to 14. But I'm going to just change that to Colossians 1, verses 9 to 14. 9 to 14. I just realized 1 to 8 Tarang did last Sunday. We are looking at 9 to 14. Adi. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fulfill, to fill you with the knowledge of His will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please Him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience, and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son He loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Let's pray as we start. Dear God, help us understand your word. Uh, remove every distraction. Uh, Holy Spirit, help us to be excited and encouraged to what you'd like us to learn today. May our lives never be the same. In Jesus' name, amen. So an introduction to the passage, we're going to be looking at verses 9 to 14. It'll help if you have your you know, Bibles with you. If you don't have a physical Bible, you can put your data on. Go on Google Google, and put Colossians 1, 9 to 14. This will come up. But keep it, it'll, it'll be healthy if you have the passage with you. These five verses, five, six verses <clears throat> that Adi just read for us is basically a prayer that Paul is making for the people of Coloss. Hence the name of the book Colossians. Paul was an apostle and he makes a prayer for the people of Coloss. So he in fact starts off in verses 9, he starts off by saying, for this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. If you read verse, Colossians 1 verses 1 and 2, you realize it was Paul writing along with uh, his companion Timothy. Paul and Timothy were actually writing this letter to the people of Colossus. That's why it's in the, not in the singular sense, it's in the, it's in the plural sense, 
um, for this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. But, but I'd like to just stop and ask a question. Stop and ask, what are some things that you would not stop praying for in your life? He starts off verse 9 by saying, since we heard about, we have not stopped praying for you. And then we're going to see what he's, why he says what he says. Just stop and ask, think about our own lives. What are some things that you and I would definitely not stop praying for? Your family, you would not stop praying for your family. You would not stop praying for health. Food and shelter, you would not stop praying for food and shelter. Okay? One more. Career, marriage, future, future. Okay. Marriage also. Okay? Whatever you answer to that question is, is whatever your answer to this question is, what are some things that you would not stop praying for? Whatever your answer to this question is, reveals the dominant and pinnacle priority of your life. Right? Because you're not stopping to pray for something. It reveals how important, it reveals of, of you know, uh, the dominant priority of your life. And let's understand what was Paul's dominant priority as he makes this prayer. He is telling that as soon as uh, Tarang explained last week of, of a person named Epaphras. Epaphras was the person who gives him the news of these brothers and sisters of the people of Coloss. As soon as Paul he's saying in verse 9, as soon as we heard, since the day we heard he gets down to work and starts praying for them. All things, Paul thinks that by praying for them, it will be serving them even more effectively compared to actually meeting them in person. So the chunk of all that we're going to be looking at is what, what does Paul commit to praying for, for the people of Coloss? Okay, so let's, so, so I'm just reading, I'm, I'm just scanning through the first three verses, 9, 10, 11, and 12. Look at Paul's priorities. He says in verse 9, Continually ask God to fill you with knowledge. And then in verse 10, he says, so that you may live a life worthy. And verse 11, he says, so that you may have great endurance and patience. Essentially, Paul is praying for three things. Now, there are, there are more than three things in this, in, the, in the six verses that we read. He's praying that they would know something. He is praying that they would live in a particular way. And he is praying that they would have something. And then there are a number of other things he says. So essentially, Paul is praying that they would be, they would know God, the will of God. That they would live a life worthy, pleasing to God. And that according to God's glorious might, they would have endurance and they would have patience. And so, let's just flesh this out more. The first thing. Paul's first focus, if you see verse 9, is on the fact that God has a plan for us and he's focused on God's plan for us. When he says in verse 9, we continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will. He is praying to God that the people of Coloss would know what God wants for them. And he says, how do they do this? Through all wisdom and understanding that the Holy Spirit gives. Simply put, simply put, Paul is praying that the people of Coloss would know God's will. He is praying that the believers of Coloss would know what God's plan is. And it's important that you and I realize that this is not just a one-off prayer. He is saying, we have not stopped praying for you. It's so important for Paul. <laughs> it's so important. He's not stopping to pray. Lord, I pray that they know your will. It's not just a one prayer he does, you know, one minute a day. It's something that he's, he's saying, he's committed to praying continually. So we need to also realize, and Tarang addressed it last Sunday, that these were young believers, these were new believers who started off well in their faith. In fact, in verse 6 it says, ever since the day you heard, the gospel has been bearing fruit. And so these are new people. 
God has granted them this new birth because of Epaphras, the, the preaching of his Epaphras. And yet Paul is saying, we want you to know what God's plan is. This is yet another evidence, my friend. We, we did it last Sunday in, in, in GCL. That the gospel is not only the entry point. Simply believing the gospel is not a once upon a time event. In fact, it's the whole point of life. And that's why Paul feels that they need to be filled with the knowledge of God's will. And so what does that mean? Now, is this, is, did Paul mean, is this primarily, was Paul primarily thinking, uh, 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 Lord, I pray that they know what they need to be doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, Lord, I pray that they know who to marry. Lord, I pray that they know what work to take. Lord, I pray, was that what he was praying? I, I, we don't know. But we see something else. There was a deep desire in, in Paul's prayer. What was not just to ask God for marriage partners or kind of uh, salary or kind of career or size of home, however important that is. There was something else Paul is pointing to in this prayer. Look at this. Paul is praying, Paul is pointing to something even more better and worthwhile. He's saying in verse 10, Paul's prayer is rooted in a desire so that the people of Coloss may live a life that is worthy of the Lord. That they would live a life in verse 10 that is pleasing to the Lord. Now think of the term worthy. This is, this is, this is not Mark Manuel's portion. This is what I understand. This is my personal understanding. Think of the term worthy of the Lord. To live a life worthy of the Lord, what does that mean? The word worth, worthy comes from the word worth. The word worth is almost always associated with the you know with terms like estimation and value. In our daily lives, you and I are always highly estimating and putting high valuations on things that we cherish the most. Not just on stocks and mutual funds. Generally in life, we are always highly estimating and putting high valuations on things we cherish the most. If you and I cherish fitness, which I think is a good thing, put a high estimation and high valuation on saving one hour a day to go to the gym because 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 fitness is something that we cherish or should cherish okay and i mean and, and there are many such examples but look at this worthy of the lord if the lord and what the lord has done is genuinely of high value to us paul feels oh, paul feels there is a way we will live there is a way we will live. If what, if what God has done, if what God the Father has done by sending Jesus to the cross in our place, if that, if the gospel is genuinely of such high valuation in our lives, there is a way we will live. And Paul is desiring that the people of Coloss, many ways even you and I, cherish and value the Lord so much that we are willing to alter our lives in the way we live. That, we are with, that our actions are similar to our convictions. In fact, in another letter, the, Paul himself is writing to the church in Philippi. He says in chapter 1, verse 27, we don't have to go there. Uh, live your lives in a manner worthy of the gospel of Jesus. In Hebrews, uh, the writer of Hebrews says, only let your manner of faith, uh, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. So regarding the will of God, when 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 he says in verse nine, this is what he's saying in verse nine, where is it gone? I pray that God will fill you with the knowledge of his will. Regarding the will of God, there are the Bible gives us glimpses and glances of what God's will looks like. It shows us what God's will looks like. 
in a letter to Thessalonica, Paul writes, it is God's will that you should be sanctified. And then he goes on to speak on how they should use their physical bodies. Again, in that same letter, he writes, rejoice, always pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And he says this in the context of suffering, I think. So it's perhaps easier to understand why Paul is continually praying that they would know what God's will is. And in, in fact, to understand what God wills, we would need to know what God is like. To know what God is like, not just the close brothers and sisters, but even you and me, we need to spend time with God, listening to what he says, isn't it? It's all about our relationship with God. No wonder this is such an important prayer that Paul makes. No wonder this is such an important prayer that Paul makes. Very rarely, as somebody who is getting married, very rarely prior to marriage, people begin to live life with their partner just from the first day of marriage. Very rarely do people see their partner for the first time on the, you know, on the wedding day. Very rarely do people you know, talk and get to know about their partner's lives on the first day of marriage. No. In almost all situations, we get to know our partner and then we enter marriage. Isn't it? It's all about our relationship with God. I'm, I'm going to just quickly uh, go to the next part. Paul desires that every Christian endures to the end. I'm reading verse 11. Being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and you may have great patience. It means keeping going in faith, love and hope until the one thing that we hope for has been attained. And how do we keep on bearing the fruit of good works in the face of many temptations? Paul says we need to be strengthened with all power. Now, why does Paul, why do you think Paul thinks that it is important for them or it is important to be praying for them for the purpose of endurance and patience. They're doing well in faith. They've, they've, they've started off well in faith. Why do you think Paul thinks it's so important to pray for their endurance and patience? Endurance simply is defined, definition of endurance is simply defined as bearing hardships. So, Synonyms of the word endurance has words like capacity, stamina, vitality. Why do you think Paul feels these attributes are important for these new Colossus Christians? Why do you think hardships, capacity, stamina, vitality is important for these new Christians? And why do you think all of that is important for Christians of all times, including you and me? And one of the many rash, of the many rational reasons, I'm sure there are many rational reasons. I just want to mention two, for, two, in my opinion. I think we are constantly tempted to lose sight of our first love. We are constantly tempted to lose sight of the lover of our souls. Another reason why I think it's important that we, that, that Paul thinks it's important to, you know, for them to endure and have patience is because we are too easily drawn into desiring things that this world offers, even though once upon a time we only desired God. We're very easily drawn, attracted by what the world offers. So it doesn't matter what the battle is. When you and I are in the middle of it, it is still tough. We feel alone. The future seems bleak. The pressure looks set only to increase. And this is precisely the moment we turn to the Lord, even if turning to the Lord is the last thing we feel like doing. It's all the more important to pray for these things, for even for others, 
Therefore, I think Paul knew that, Coloss that the Colossians had made their first steps of faith and he is now praying for them to carry on to the end. And there's something about endurance and Christians. If I, if I, if we scan through the letters of Paul, and he's written actually a, a majority of the New Testament. I'm, I'm, I'm making the statement with, with caution. I'm, I'm pretty sure you can you, you can go back and uh, uh, check it theologically. Paul didn't seek and go after one-time converts. Generally, as his as his personality, Paul didn't, uh, you know, put high valuation on one-time converts. He was seeking disciples of Jesus Christ. In every letter that he writes, encouraging the church and the leaders to be able to raise disciples. And one of the one of the tendencies and natural desires that disciples have is the is the ability to, to endure, is the, is the capacity to have patience and endure to the end. This is one of the surest signs of the spirit at work. One-time converts tend to have a tendency to come to get something from Jesus. Disciples have a tendency to live for Jesus. See that? Converts have a tendency to come as long as there's a benefit from spirituality. Disciples pursue regardless. And therefore, I think it's significantly important that Paul is praying for new Christians to persevere and endure. The last thing I want to address for this morning Is gratitude. In verse 12, Paul says, they give joyful thanks to the Father. He is giving joyful thanks to the Father because the Father has qualified them to share in the inheritance of holy people in the kingdom of light. Paul seems to be filled with joy and gratitude because God has qualified the people of Coloss to share in eternal Riches. Is that there in your Bible? Is verse 12 there in your Bible? We just spoke of perseverance and endurance. Perseverance and endurance might be hard, but it is nothing in comparison to what we already have in Jesus. It is pale in comparison to all that we can look forward to Christ. Friends, your eternity Eternal inheritance and my eternal inheritance, just like the Colossus eternal inheritance, because of the gospel, is unique to our faith. We are able to persevere, not hoping to achieve our eternal uh, inheritance. We are able to persevere because Christ first persevered and endured the cross to already achieve redemption for you and me. We don't pursue, we don't persevere erratically, irrationally, and arbitrarily. We are able to persevere because Christ has already achieved our redemption. He has already blessed us with eternal, you know, with riches in eternity. We are called to endurance, but first, but, but Christ first endured to God's satisfaction on our behalf, and this is the richness of our faith. This is the richness of the gospel. In fact, look at Paul, the way he's imagining things. He, Paul's gratitude to God because these believers, uh, you know, just seems he's so convinced that this moment of their life is an amazing event. It has got some radical implications have taken place. They're no longer what they were. They are now people with eternal riches. Paul is convinced that this is an amazing life event that has happened to the people of Colossus. In fact, it looks like a revolution. Why? 
because verse 12 says god has qualified them to share inheritance of his holy people i want to look at this word qualification qualification is a word we also very use commonly today in fact qualification is become an obsession today it's a modern day obsession it's perfectly understandable that when the corporate market when the job market is so competitive especially in a in a globalized world in a rat race culture in a very competitive culture where only the fittest survive where only the best and qualified you know uh, uh, click and make it the only way to get ahead is to prove to everybody that i am superior to all my rivals i am superior to all my other colleagues and therefore an obvious route to get what we want to get is to promote ourselves and the way we do that is by accumulating these qualifications this is who i am i'm a son of this i'm a son of that i know this person i have influence and we're trying to constantly accumulate uh, uh, you know these this 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 modern day obsess this obsession with qualifications just to make it big just to survive and look at the kind of qualifications that paul has in mind when he says verse 12 you mean see that he says he says in verse 12 isn't it paul qualifications in mind for sharing he shares in god's kingdom of light but he's saying that this inheritance comes this inheritance comes to holy people paul is thanking god because god has qualified the people of colos to get what only holy people get in fact that's what you and i get god how does it make you feel god qualifies you to get what holy people get how does it make you feel how does it make you feel can you believe that so the confusion as we read this is well at least it's confusion for me i don't know about you does that mean i've got to attain a certain level of holiness because this is an inher- in inheritance for holy people you see that in the verse it's an inheritance for holy people am i supposed to obtain a certain level of holiness and if yes how holy should i be is there a a standard of holiness that i need to attain in order for me to get this inheritance i mean really what should i do should i pass a theology exam will that mean i've met some standard of holy and that's how many christians live our lives we think our religion is a religion for good people therefore those who are bad need not apply to christianity because this is an inheritance for holy people so when so when you know yeah i mean to get to hear this sometimes you invite somebody to church no 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 i'm not good enough for church i don't think i can come to church and i think a fundamental problem is how you and i measure holiness or even measure goodness how good is good enough how holy is holy enough right now sitting in this room there are all of us are here think of two ends of a spectrum think of a end of a spectrum of a gangster unholiness a person is a gangster very unholy at the end, at one end of the spectrum and the other end is a saint very holy gangster very unholy saint very holy i am pretty sure that if i asked each of us where do we stand none of us would be Some of us would be in it. None of us would. None of us would probably naturally on our own choose one of the ends. Okay, we would possibly pitch ourselves somewhere roughly in between by saying, "I'm not a gangster, but I'm not a saint." 
I'm not the most holiest person in the world. But I'm not the most holiest person in the world. So let's say, suppose the holiness pass mark is 50%. Nowhere in the Bible it's mentioned. I'm just, just imagine with me. So the holiness percentage is 50%. You get 50% holiness and you've passed. You get the inheritance. But you only receive 49%. Now, 49% of holiness is quite a lot of holiness, but it's not meant 50%. The problem with this thinking is, it's not a right way of thinking. We, don't, we, we Christians think like that. But we cannot think like that. I'll tell you why. Never in history was there anything less than perfection appropriate for a holy God. And therefore, this kind of discussion is actually very futile, unnecessary. Now look at that verse again. Verses 12. Okay, and let me, let me actually just read it. Read the whole verse. And giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people of the kingdom of light. Friends, Paul's gratitude is the only possible response is because this qualification is granted. It's not earned. It's a qualification that is given. It's granted. This is the gospel. This is your hope and my hope. We cannot earn the benefits of the, it's granted to us. You see the difference? It's the father who does the qualifying. It is he who gives you and me the status of sainthood, of holiness in the first place. And I think that is important because as you continue reading that verse, since we are all trapped within the dominion of darkness, that's what the verse says. We ourselves, we don't have any means to escape to the kingdom of light. It is impossible. Verse 12 speaks of kingdom of light. Verse 13 speaks of kingdom of darkness. We're going to be looking at that quickly in a minute. But we got to realize that it is God who grants it. He does qualifying. If there's, if there's only one thing you will take back from this morning stock, let this immerse, let this, let, this, let this sink in. Let this truth, would you just drown in this truth? Would you drown in this truth, my friends? That the Father qualifies. He is the one who, who, who does it in the first. He grants it. Okay, so, yeah, my last... Rescued from darkness. Verse 13 in your Bibles, in my Bibles and, and most of our Bibles, starts with the key word, for. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness, brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So, God has not only made the impossible possible, he's also made the impossible available. He's not just made the impossible possible for us. He's made the impossible available for you and me. How else we, how else could we who cannot make ourselves holy, how else could we be qualified? Even if I, I was thinking, even if I decide to start a new life from today, from 2022, I will only do holy things in my life. Even if I have to do that, I still have so many years of sin. I have still have so many years of rebellion in my past that I've got to deal with. Nobody can change the past. And God, in, because of Jesus Christ, offers forgiveness for all of that. And the beauty of this verse, really, my friends, is to say that none of us sitting over here today needs to be a slave of our history. None of us. Can, it needs to be a slave of our history. So verse 12 speaks of inheritance of his people, holy people in the kingdom of light. 
and verse 13 says he's rescued us from the dominion of darkness. Now, in the spiritual realm of the universe, there is only one ultimate battle that is between the battle between darkness and light. The last thing it wants, that is the, that is the, the darkness, is for people to flee and seek freedom in light. That's the nature of the enemy that we see, that we see in scripture. The last thing that darkness wants for you and me is for us to flee and seek freedom, security, asylum, and shelter in light. Therefore, the only hope for rescue is for that kind of rescue that can be achieved and won, not on our own, but on our behalf. And that is precisely what Jesus did for us. He rescued us. He gave us hope on our behalf. My friends, as we prepare our hearts for communion this morning, I want to get across a gospel imperative question. And this is the question I'd like us to think about. Why did Jesus die? Why did Jesus die? I'm reading Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28. says, Christ, having, uh, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time not to deal with sin. You know what? O open, open verse 28 if you can read it. I should have just put it over there. Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. We wait for Jesus from heaven, who is raised from the dead, Jesus who delivers us from the wrath, from the anger to come. In other words, really to say, if, if Jesus alone can, if Jesus does not come to save us from wrath and anger, we will be swept away forever. Without Jesus, we will be swept away forever. But this reminds us that we can be healthy in our waiting and enduring and in patience because sin was dealt with once for all. There is no new sacrifice needed. Jesus was the perfect sacrifice. Our shield from our future, sorry, our shield from future wrath and anger was secured because Christ suffered in our place. And this is counterintuitive to what people think of spirituality today. I can save myself from God's anger by doing good things. And we realize whatever percentage you put of yourself on the gangster to saint spectrum of holiness, nothing less than perfection satisfies God. Only Jesus Christ met that perfection. Only for the sake of the cross, my friends, let us celebrate our freedom as we celebrate communion this morning. Now what I am going to do is I'm going to request um, yeah, I'm going to request uh, maybe uh, Alan and Adip, would you help in distributing the bread and juice? But before we do that, before we do that, I'd like to, before we do that, I'd like to just say that for those of us who've come to church for the first time or after a long time, or for those of us who are just having questions on Christianity and exploring the Christian faith, I'd like to just say that this communion, symbolic of the bread and juice that we that we will partake of, is a celebration reserved for those who have put our faith in Jesus Christ, right? And if you feel you're still examining, if you feel you're still exploring, you've not yet, you, 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 I mean, you're not at a place where you're in a decision, I'd, I'd encourage you to just let the bread and juice pass, right? But this is as good a moment as any to respond to Jesus Christ in obedience. And now I'm going to request Alan and... Uh, Adip to pass the bread and juice and uh, let everybody get the bread and juice together and we will partake of it together. Right? You can just please distribute it. 